All right, wholeness, welcome. This is Josh Dippold of IntegratingPresence.com. Today, again, I have uh, the lovely Wendy Nash with me. Wendy, how's it going? Yeah, good, thank you. I think I'm I'm not muted. I'm muted. Oh, I can hear uh, Okay, you can hear me? It's going okay. It's just I've got the, the inside timer. It says tap to unmute, so I'm going, I don't know what to do. But I'll just, if you can hear me, this is all good. It is. Do, do, yeah, don't unmute on Insight Timer. Um, okay. All, all right. right. That's it's. I'm new to this, so uh, to our listener, our listening, and people, other everyone involved. Um, I apologize for my lack of technical expertise. There you go. Yes, and so the the other thing is, I've got this kind of rigged very interestingly. We've got uh, Zoom going on. I've got my external microphone getting Wendy's. Um, audio so it will go into insight timer because if you look at insight timer it's just me so um but the video will be available later and yeah thanks for all who joined last time and yeah here we go so i guess we we did not get any questions to start off with which is okay because i have plenty of uh great questions to start us off with and um if anybody could just that's here could just chime in in the chat and see if they can hear okay and anything like that that would be great um so the first one is the the most basic and obvious right and i'll drop the question in the chat too what is meditation actually i i led a retreat the other day it was just a half one with beginner people can you hear me okay so i can yeah one. yep great i moved my mic to be a little bit better Okay. Um, and that that's a common question. And, and I've been really reflecting what is it because there's a whole lot of info out there and people have ideas about it. And the, I th uh, one time I had a neighbour and she said, my kind of meditation is reading a book. And that is relaxation. So that is not meditation. So I can say that is not meditation. Somebody else I know said, I like my form of meditation is to take a stroll along the beach. And to and I'm like, that that's not meditation, that's relaxation. Somebody else said, I like to sit on the bank and watch the waves go by and just let my thoughts, you know, come and go and, and all the rest. And that is also not meditation that is contemplation so slightly different but similar somebody um so somebody else said you know i get when i'm in a bad mood i sit at the piano for a couple of hours and then my thoughts clear and i come out and i'm like a new person and i said yeah that's flow that's not meditation and he also said you know, I used to get really angry in the traffic. And when somebody went past, I'd be like, rah, I'm really angry. But I'm training myself so that every time a car goes past, I just don't react. And I said, that is meditation because it's training the mind. So even though it's a very short moment, it's just an instant, it's this guy driving past He's really making the effort to think, how do I want to be in the world? And bringing consciousness and awareness to his behavior to retrain the mind to be less angry. So that's what I would say. What about you, Josh? Huh. You know, it, you think that if I would ask this question and I'm going to co-host this show, I would have a better answer. And I love this answer, Wendy, how you gave real life examples of working with people at, of their definition of meditation. And if I can just jump on and amplify the mind training aspect of it, you know, um, now, if we were to look at the attention or awareness aspect of meditation, in a way, the uh, prior examples, um, I've heard someone say before that we're always meditating on something, meaning that our, um, it's probably not a good definition, but our attention is somewhere all the time. So we, so we, can, we can test this out right now um, with this classic uh, example. Okay, I want you to just stop paying attention for a second. Just stop being aware. Just, just cut it out and stop it altogether, okay? Give a few seconds here. 
like it's impossible, right? There's no way we can really do that. And even when we're lost in thought or entangled, there's some kind of attention going on. And this is a fascinating thing too. I'd like to maybe pick up on like, but then we kind of like wake out of, uh, wake up out of it. And then we're like, oh wow, I've just been lost in thoughts for like five minutes or 10 minutes or who knows how long, or I've been just entangled in this emotion. I didn't even really uh, realize it until I've got this reference point of, oh yeah, that's not happening now. <laughs> So yes, so I think I've um, I've kind of kind of uh, skirted the question here just a little bit, um, but if you want to pick back up on that, and before you do, I wonder if we we're just going to go ahead with the recording here. But for whatever reason, it's saying one meditator present in the Insight Timer Room. So I'm wondering if that leads me to feel that it, it's something's not going on. Do you see a, a status count? I can just see one meditator here. So that's uh, that's highly unlikely. I've never really had that before because it should be two at least. It should be me and you. So um, if you if you'd like to keep, and I'm going to try this again. Um, we're going to stay on Zoom and keep talking. But okay, okay. do some rejigging. So this is very interesting. So this is like. What do two meditators do when there is a technical glitch? Yes. You just, and this is the nature of it, you know, like we are kind of um, stuck in this. I think there is no one here. Because, yeah. I, like I don't, I, I think we're in a room of our own. Yes. I don't, I don't get it. There's really no other option. And it seems to be this. I wonder if Insight Timer is having technical difficulties or what's going on here. But, uh, Anyway, it's it, it, in my dashboard, that's the only option I hit enter. It seems like it's going. Um, I guess the other thing we could do really briefly is uh, just hop back on Zoom. Do you want to do that? Should we do that? All right, I'll come back on. Okay, let's try that. All right. Board. Here we are again. Uh, again, with, there was potential tef, uh, technical difficulties. It could just be nobody's tuning in right now either, uh, because it, I really didn't. It didn't look much different, and now it still says uh, one meditator here. And it's just Wendy and I. But anyway, it's okay. So even if nobody shows up, we've got some people on Wisdom Map listening, and also uh, the recording too. So we were talking about what is meditation, and uh, we don't have to go over that again because we've already. Um, talked about that and I can stitch this the recording together and um, so we were talking about we're always paying attention to something right there's awareness all the time and sometimes we wake up out of what we've been uh, what we've been entangled in or lost in do you have any how to, how to address that I, mean, I guess in practice or just some overall comments and wisdom about that I think that is consciousness like there is always consciousness and the consciousness and awareness are not the same so for me they are really different and focus is not the same so i guess i think for me i like the i like the tibetan buddhist approach sort of idea of it so the tibetan buddhist word for meditation is gom which is familiarization you may know this which is how familiar are you with the mind? And their definition is that it is about mind training. Because, you know, I've thought about if you sit on the side of the, the there are people I know who, the, the person I know who said, oh, I sit by the side of the river and water and watch the, you know, just let my thoughts subside, is to me, the problem with that is it's not actually thinking ahead. How do I want to be in my life ahead? What sort of qualities of heart? What sense of wisdom? How can I learn from this? What can I change? What can I develop? And I guess that's a bit kind of, what do they call that? Uh, Self-helpy, which is sort of a little bit where we're at. But to me, I guess the really big thing is, is it addressing the ego's yearning for control that's that's big um, but remind me of that again I wanted to pick up on some of the things 
he said there. And it, well, yes, it's there's got to be a point to it, right? I mean, there's so many pointless things we do in our lives, or seemingly pointless. It seems like there's an intent and a goal involved, right? A reason, a purpose for um, meditation. Um, and I think a distinction that might be relevant to be brought in here is um, Samatha Vipassana in Theravada things. And I'm not going to go too much into the Vipassana, but from what I understand with just the Samatha training is it is just bringing the attention back over and over again. So it is a type of training, right? So there is, a, even though it's very simple, you're doing one single thing over and over again, there's a point to it. It is to yeah. um, increase concentration or uh, samadhi, to, to cultivate samadhi. And it's like unifying the mind, gathering the mind, um, collecting the mind, um, and uh, I guess, yeah, unifying and calming as well. And this is for, uh, at least in the Buddhist perspective, it's not just because it just feels good, which it does. And this also relates to what Wendy was talking about earlier about, you know, reading a book. Why these things often feel good is because we keep our attention focused on one thing over and over again. Not exactly the same thing here, though. But this is in um, service to building up the mind strength so it can be, tr um, so it can focus like a laser sometimes. That's one perspective of it. Another way is it just to um, kind of unify, gather, collect the mind and feel good, you know, a pleasant abiding. So, but on the laser approach, when that's, when that's built up, that faculty is built up, then it can be um, aimed at things for investigation, like things in Vipassana, right? Um, so it's, it's often likened to a tripod and maybe I'm going too many different directions here. But um, the stabilization of um, samatha is like having this firm grounding and base to able to aim that attention wherever we want. That's one approach of it. Now, Wendy's um, comments about addressing the ego, was it at the end there? Yeah, like the point isn't to get to a particular state of mind yes, that's right so because i just want i just want to say something that my understanding of shamatha samatha is that it's not about it's not concentration as in super tight narrowing it's concentration as in it's centering in the midst so think of the eye of the storm beautiful and that's that gathering fusion kind of thing so it's not excluding it's just holding still in the midst of the storm. And I quite like that. That, and I would say that is that I personally don't like, I got to Shamatha this morning, Shamatha meditation this morning, and I was going, this is kind of boring. I'm full on an insight person. I love the Vipassana style of like investigation and inquiry because I really, I used to be really angry and I, and I want to understand how to not be, angry anymore but like that driver so anyway i digress same way because it's uh, i find it boring as well and just have to know that this is a training and it's a very important point because a lot of teachers say they because of this western notion of concentration oh, you really got to bear down and, and tighten up and focus really tight on one thing so uh i this con uh centration right like you're centering yourself it's such a beautiful way so um yeah it's kind of a quick and dirty interpretation to say concentration it's not what we usually mean here in the west but um, by that as well so and that's the thing so um a lot of times we like to go with our strengths and there's this notion that we should continue with our strengths right and and, and build them up uh because you know um, so we don't get too distraught and discouraged on the on the other hand though you know those weaknesses also need to be addressed somehow I feel um, so this is something I probably have to do more of as well as this um, Samatha practice and yeah the, because it can I mean this is the thing that goes in can go into jhana too um, which I'm gonna put set aside because there's so, I mean, it's like a, a Buddhist trigger word. I think we've mentioned this before. Um, so many people have so many different ideas about what jhana is and what isn't, things like this. Of course, I'm always open to hearing people's, I just hesitant to say myself just because it's so, no, that's not, that's not, uh, that's not jhana, you know? Okay. 
And in the monastics in Theravada tradition, from what I understand, they're not allowed to disclose their attainments anyway, right? So they can't say if they've hit second jhana, third jhana. And we, I've talked about this before, the pros and cons of that as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, like... There are, I heard about this these retreats that the CEOs and you know San Francisco like tech gurus they go on like a week they get all wired up in the mind and then they get into these blissful states and so they have this idea that this is enlightenment but enlightenment but they have done nothing about the sort of egoic yearning for control for engaging for for being right for having a very dualistic mind so the ego will divide into good and bad you know well you're at the second level of jhana so jhana just to unpack that for people because i see we've got four meditators here so thank you very much to our four meditators um, for joining this call um but jhana is a sort of a particular i guess uh, way of uh, sort of a particular spaciousness in the mind a quality of spaciousness and there are different um they call them attainments it sounds sort of like you've got it and merit you know it's all these these funny words that have this we're so driven we think okay you've got to be a good person and you've got to attain this as if it's some sort of university degree or something like that so i think it's just it's not whatever we think it means in english it doesn't so so it just it's just like something that happens and you know you can train the mind to have that but i often wonder how much of that can still keep the ego in check because as eckhart tolle says if the ego can sneak in by the back door and i know that from my own self and and i know that from others so yeah i see we have four meditators more i would really love yes. to hear what if, if somebody one of the four of you hello could just ask us a question that would be really lovely um that would be very nice so please do okay so the, the why we're waiting for questions here it could be anything i mean it could be from the basic thing don't you know i won't call you out if you don't want or, you know, not call out. I mean, say your uh, username if you if you wish not to, too. So we can just leave that anonymous unless you'd like. Um, so I want to pick up, though, on the, the jhana thing as attainments and then ego, too. So these are really big topics. Um, attainments, on I totally agree everything Wendy said. At, at the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, the, the polarity of this is, well, you know, the positive side of attainments, if there can be one, is that it keeps people that are goal driven and something to look forward to. However, just that in itself can be a challenge for some people because they don't know how to help. Um, I think that there can be challenges in trying to uh, set goals in meditation, although I think they sometimes are needed to keep people on track, right? these different stages of enlightenment, things like that, they can be health, helpful reference points or markers or things to, um, um, I guess, benchmarks in order to talk to teachers and friends about. But it's, yeah, before all that, have to look at, am I clinging to attain this? Am I overly striving to attain something? Am I put, putting the importance on the attainment or lack of attainment? So those are all issues and, mm -hmm. and potential trouble spots. At, you know, at, at the same time, um, if those are very helpful, if those attainments are something that help the practice overall and lead towards addressing the ego properly, lead towards our long-term happiness and well-being and the happiness and well-being of others and everyone, then I would say, um, yes, just be careful how you go about um, these attainments that are mentioned that you hear meditators talk about. And at the same time, we don't, it, it's really tricky, tricky because one of the reasons I'll just say now that, that um, monastics don't talk about their attainments is because it gets, it can, well, it can get into competitions. If you have one monk that's more attained than the others, well, then they might give him more food. They might pay more attention to him and neglect others. So there's, it's a whole big ball of wax. I would just say, investigate this for yourself. Um, and the human, the human, it just what it says is the human condition is the human condition. And just because you've been meditating for 20 years and you're a monastic, 
doesn't say anything about whether you know your dirty tricks you know tibet was a feudal system they the sort of the government was you know all buddhist but it was very feudal and lots of murders and skullduggery and by the senior community um yeah people in the community and you know we all know that, that you know there have been mis misbehaviors by senior monastics and actually i had an interesting so here's here's one for you josh just on a slightly different note so um i um i signed up for a retreat and it cost quite a lot of money and the retreat got cancelled because something big happened by the people and they they said actually we we're going to have to not only postpone this but we're going to cancel the retreat and they aren't holding another one so there's nothing else to do and i have a bit of a deadline with regards to it i can't go into it but but just that and so they refunded everything but a hundred dollars us dollars they said we're not going to do that because it's a unrefundable registration fee that's what you ticked when you signed up of course i thought well if i opt out that means i won't get a refund of a hundred dollars and that's i kind of get that but they cancelled it and they're saying no we're not going to give that back so it's very interesting to look at that from a dharma perspective so this is a dharma organization offering a dharma buddhist retreat and i'm a dharma practitioner and i'm going what do i how do i respond to that actually because you know like a hundred dollars in australian dollars that's 150 dollars it's over 100 it's like 158 dollars for us and that's that's you know like um three weeks of food for me so that's a lot of money and so I've got that, but then I'm thinking, well, it's the Dharma, but then they haven't given me a choice. And it's very interesting to have to sit here and go, well, how much am I identifying with it? How much am I going, this is my right, this is unacceptable, which is plenty. <laughs> and it's a complicated question. So, yeah, I would, I would, I mean, I've said this is just really not the go. You cannot do that. Like, really, I'd like my money back. You you guys cancelled it and I get it. I understand. And But your insurance is going to cover it. So we live in this commercial world where this is what is the deal. So, yeah, cough up. And so, but it's interesting to see that. So you too have that response. And I was telling my partner and he too had that response. But but sort of what is acceptable if i had given an option for it if they had said okay we'll take five ten dollars you know as just to cover our cost because it has cost a bit of money to set up but it but there was something a bit hard line about it which made me feel like that's the ego you know the ego we talked about the ego before rises up and when i feel like i've met the ego i too rise up with the ego and it becomes this kind of kabang in the middle and what was interesting for me is historically I've always kind of yielded because I thought, ah, oh, well, I can't ask and they've decided that and I'll just get angry and whatever, but I'll just walk away. And this time because of my Dharma practice, I said, I, I am not happy with that outcome and this is, this is not right. So it's interesting to look at the role of money in this in this world and the Dharma, which says you shouldn't be attached to money and material goods, but we need money because we've got to go to the supermarket and buy things. So I've got to pay rent, all that sort of stuff. Very fascinating question with something that doesn't interest me too much. However, in this case is is extremely important, I feel, because yeah, well, on so many levels as well. And then we bring in the spirit of generosity, right, in the Dharma practice, right? You're giving from the spirit of generosity. And we're talking about a deposit here, right? We're not talking about, uh, okay, we're asking for donations here, right? Not at all. Uh, we're, we're talking about, okay, well, you know, who does the onus lie on, you know? So this, the obvious to jump right to a, a fix, you know, because I like to fix things, right? Um, so this is something I haven't seen people written in right into their policy 
Um, and this needs to be addressed, I feel. It's, it really would be simple, plain as day, to write it in there. If the retreat is canceled by any reason, so-and-so, this is how it works out, right? If you don't agree to those terms and conditions, not. So it seems like it, you happened upon a gray area where they hadn't written that into the agreement, right? I think uh, that is to jump to the to, to the end here. They didn't say anything about, okay, if we cancel, this is what happens. Or did they? Did they say that? They may have said, you know, it's a couple of months ago. I don't really Fine. remember. And, um, and you know, whatever. And for mm -hmm. me, I have to do this retreat because it's part of some other part of process and I have to do it by a particular deadline and they aren't offering an alternative retreat and all, you know, so it's basically... They're not? Then they're not offering an alternative retreat. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So it's very interesting to kind of sit here going, actually, I'm really not happy about this. Yeah. I'm really, really not happy. And so I have a, I have an expressive kind of clingy character, and I have an aggressive tendency and an angry tendency. So I'm sitting here kind of, I'm really pissed off, <laughs> you know. And I've worked with anger for twenty years, and just to sort of see that arise. But what I do notice is that even though I'm very angry about that decision, there is nonetheless still something which feels calmer than it would have been, less temper tantrumy than it would have been. So yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a complex, it's an interesting situation. Yes. That, yeah, the sort of the basic understanding is that when you sign up for a retreat, if the retreat is cancelled, of course they will fully refund. That's right. And and so because you can't just go setting up retreats and can't, I mean, if there's no not nothing to address that, then people could set up retreats all the time until people catch on and nobody joins them because they're canceling their retreats and taking all the uh, taking the deposit money. So that's this the obvious, like realistic part of this. But like Wendy's talking about the even deeper significance of this is when we're tested in life and this comes up right and then and this ties into the ego too one way to look at ego is like a, a positive ego and a negative ego and even further is a um by negative i mean or by positive ego i mean so we can walk around in life and remember mm -hmm. our name or like our social security number in the states right and we can we know that we're like uh, interacting with people and that this is called josh or whatever people call this josh things like that right and then uh but there's also also like an inferior inferior ego and a superior ego and then we get into spiritual egos too so I like this delineation as well so so then we can see this when things like this happen and how we respond and Wendy I would say um, you don't seem like there's any kind of trace or shred of anger from this at all it seems like and at the same time it's not like you're cold and emotionless either it seems like this is really a uh, well-balanced process it was it was uh, viewed and responded to you know very healthily so we've got personality types that are they they need more assertiveness then we have some personality types that they're assertive way too much right they probably need to maybe back down a little bit or you know so that goes with this inferior and in, in, uh, superior ego and which I feel this type of meditation practice helps first um, see that very clearly and know this and then also kind of course correct or bring it more into balance as well. And then when we set that aside, well, then we've got or I've got spiritual ego now. Right. So and that's a whole nother ball of wax. Yeah. 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 Actually, you know, that that's one thing I've been I've been really thinking about because because I know somebody and he is very, very clear. And yet we have these conversations and I'm like, that's pure ego. So it's this very strange conundrum where he he sees the ego in its fullness and yet his character is kind of hooked in. And here's a question for you. He says, emotions are thoughts. Now I kind of go, actually there's a physicality to it. So some new research has, has came out the other day, I was reading it, and it said that when dogs are rejoined with their owner after a time apart, they get tears to me, so they cry when they see their, their owner uh, because they're so delighted. 
And like physical tears watering. Yeah, so they have physical tears of joy when they see their owner. They are connected with them. And I think, okay, well, if a dog has got the capacity for joy and, you know, and my partner once saw, um, I was like cockatoos or galahs or something like that, parrots, and they had apparently just had sex. He just really said, wow. And one, and, 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 and he, and this cockatoo just went, woo, with delight, you know, <laughs> it was just like, woo, this is a great old time. This is, my partner is very, very sensitive and he listens to the birds and he's really good. And he goes, oh, they're having a narky time today, aren't they? So he's really good at at kind of understanding what birds are saying and animals and how they're saying. So I think actually if animals have got emotions and we are animals, how can an emotion just be a thought? Is that the labelling of the emotion or is that the emotion? So I was just curious, do you have a perspective on that? So that, that's right. I see a delineation, right? And not going into the whole state where um, there's no certain, you're not giving distinctions to anything, right? I'm not talking about this state of consciousness. And by the way, we could maybe backpedal and, and define consciousness, awareness, and attention, which I feel is helpful. But for this particular thing, uh, it, it's a fascinating thing. I obviously, I would say this is an outlier. I, I'd like to hear what he says about this because I've never come across this before. And it just, it, it makes me think uh, of about when I overly identified with thinking so much that it was that the predominant predominance, and it's almost like, I wonder if this uh, meditator lives in the mind pretty much and wants, that's where they're comfortable and that's where they think everything is related to that. And there are schools where it's consciousness only, mind only, things like that. So I'm not talking about that either, really, because yes, and so what is even more fascinating about this is how can we, how can we, or I guess we, Wendy, a meditation teacher, address this so it can be experienced for oneself, right? So um, I wonder, I mean, just an example, I'm not encouraging to hit someone, but like if he experiences pain or something, okay, is that a thought? I mean, do you have a, 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 an emotion of hurt or pain? Is that a thought? What would, I wonder what he would say about that, just a practical example. Yeah, you know, there, he, he is, uh, so he, when we were talking about it, I would say he has the... And this is, uh, so apologies to people, um, this is the Chittamatra school, the mind only school. He really, you know, I am is the only single thing that you can say for sure. I exist. That is true. That's the only thing you can be sure of. It is a very Cartesian perspective. I would say not even, it would just be existence because who's the I, but we won't go into that now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but yeah. that that's right. But, you right. know, he says that, but everything else is kind of, you cannot be sure of. And so that's why he says that. Oh, and so he is in the school then. He is in the school. Oh, right? well, I like, thought wow, he was just is... like a, 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 new, a new meditator or something. Oh, no, he, he's, oh. Like, he's like, yeah. and he's very clear, like he's yeah. very, very advanced. So I, I'm always really curious in terms of my own Dharma practice mm -hmm. about my own blind spots and where you can get caught. You've just pixelated, by the way, something weird on uh -oh. the screen. Is it, is it better now? Uh, no, it's all gone blurry and pixelated. We're oh. still here. <laughs> I was going to say, as long as you can still hear me. There you are. There you are. You're back. You're back. Yeah. yeah. I'm always curious, not so much about what is the theory of meditation, sure. because it's great. You can read it from a book, you listen to a talk, and yeah, I'm meditating. But then when it's like, how do you apply that? What is that? Where do we get stuck? Where are our blind spots? So these questions that I'm asking, and then I'm kind of these topics are raising that gray line between well is it isn't it how do you respond so i'm a full human being how do i navigate this space it's very experiential sorry josh you go very very much so and maybe we can invite him on to talk because i really haven't studied this school much you know and i guess we could look at um this as perception as well so he's well we're perceiving that there are the perception of um of feeling and emotion as well as the perception of mind and thinking right or, or um but mm -hmm. then he's only perceiving 
everything is mine or our thoughts, right? Uh, in, in a way, right? So that's in a way, maybe this is more of a talk about perception than it is those those things as well. So the perceptual level gets very can get very very subtle um, as well. So yeah. yeah, I haven't studied I haven't studied this much. It would be fascinating to have maybe a dialogue about this or, or talk I, about this. Maybe actually, this is exactly what he says. He says it's all perception. So this is exactly you've hit the nail on the head. So thank you very much, Josh. Yeah. You kind of answered my question because I feel like he's very egoic in the middle of it. And yet he has this phenomenal capacity for awareness. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, such a conundrum to be in his presence. And I fully like when I'm I'm in his presence and I I just go into this full awakened state, you know, it's really lovely. And I'm like, oh, this is all ego. This is really interesting. I'm I'm kind of really receptive to his 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 way of being. But I feel like he's not relating. He also doesn't relate to people so he's not listening to people in a really heart way yeah. so you know into the emotional landscape yeah you go maybe he might ask you well um why do you think it's ego you know and it just i wonder if he, he has never said that but that's true so how would he um how would the school um address the heart you know heart qualities as well so that it seems like because this seems on more on a wisdom level where it's if it's not balanced with heart quality it gets really cold and um like disconnected from reality and this is where the true truth teaching i feel can be very helpful too there's the uh, conventional uh truth and then there's an ultimate truth right yeah so that work that explains so i mean um it explains so much uh, and can be applied so many different places to, to gain clarity. Now, um, how that's how that teaching's laid out, there's 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 levels of helpfulness about how it's done too. But yeah, so I just want to just um, say for our twelve meditators who are listening here that wisdom in this term is not about how much knowledge do you have or anything like that. Wisdom is a technical term, and it means the capacity to see the interrelatedness of everything and that everything, nothing has an inherent quality in and of itself. It is empty of any particular quality and that to have a quality, it arises dependent on other things. So everything is contextual and that is what how we gain meaning. And so when you see that, you become wise to the kind of foolish errand that we are all on thinking, things make us happy and that thing can be a person or it can be a relationship or a car not not necessarily materialistic in terms of a car house whatever but there was a time about 10 years ago I was in a different relationship and um, I, we came out of the supermarket and I said it was my birthday I think and I said wow I've got a good relationship. I've got a job I like. I have friends I like. I'm getting on well with family. I have good health, physical and mental, but I'm still unhappy. And um, and so what I realized is that I had been quite materialistic at some level about those things that they would give me happiness. Now, none of them are ma technically materialistic. But I realized that I had actually been expecting those things to give me happiness. So that shift of like that's outside me and it's going to make me happy, I think is the materialist perspective in some kind of way. Is that, is that what you feel? Absolutely. And I hear this more and more. I've had uh, at least one guest in my podcast that come to this realization. She had everything that society told her that she should have to be happy. And they were kind of external things. And so she dropped all those. And yeah, it, it just uh, it really is the case as far as I'm concerned. This, and then I wonder if this even touches on spiritual materialism as well. I'm forgetting how some people uh, define that, but that's what came to mind when you were talking too. Yeah. Yeah, I think my understanding of spiritual materialism, that's a, a term um, that Chogyam Trungpa uh, came up with. And so he's in the Tibetan tradition, just to let people know. Uh, and he, that was something that, so we talked before about the jhanas. A know, controversial the figure, first, by the way. He's a controversial figure. Oh, a very, very yeah. controversial figure. <laughs> he, was, he was chucked out of the Samya Ling in Scotland. 
Um, and that's why he ended up in America. But he actually went by from Tibet to India. He fled part of the occupation, the invasion of Tibet. He ended up in India. And because of Frida um, Betty, um, she had connections with Oxford because she'd been to Oxford. And so she got him and a cup and another one called Akong Rinpoche up into Oxford. And then they actually started a Tibetan Buddhist monastery called Samyaling in Scotland. But Chogyam Trungpa was such a drinker and womanizer. They just said, we cannot have you here. So, and so he was like smack bang at the time of the sexual revolution in the sixties. And he was having a whale of a time. And so the, yeah, it was all kind of. I've heard even like uh, worse accusations or not. I don't even know if they're accusations, if they've been proven or not. I won't go into that now, but yeah, I mean, if that wasn't enough, what Wendy just said, I've heard things that are go beyond that even and far into the unskillful side. But anyway, go ahead. And well, you I mean, we can argue, I mean, we can talk about uh, different stages on the path too about, but we, we, uh, anyway, you, to pick back up where you're at there, the spiritual. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. So, I, you know, what that says is, you know, there are many charlatans and many scoundrels in the spiritual world. Don't be foolhardy and just leap in, not witnessing, not keeping your wits about you because some people are very charming and and they have a certain level of accomplishment and attainment and clarity, but that doesn't mean to say they don't have jinks in their behavior. Including we, me for sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah yeah. 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 So you know, you and me, we're we're, we're right. you know, Not I am deeply awakened. flawed. Yes. Well, we, yeah. Well, I mean, a little bit of tongue in cheek there, but no. I mean, so yeah, we haven't reached full awakening yet, if it's not obvious. So until we do, <laughs> right? <laughs> I am deeply flawed. I am deeply flawed. I am so far from being perfect. Let me tell you. But in a and, you know, way, though, so. yeah. But to go back to spiritual materialism, huh? what you know, think about. To me, it reminds me of that that question that we had about the jhanas, these states of uh, presence of the mind, which is what a jhana is, or a dhyana. It's also called, just according to the language, and. Um, and that's really saying I've reached the first one, so therefore I've got this kind of I'm this kind of quality of good. That is spiritual materialism. I've had this kind of, uh, you know, you meditate and you have a particular le- sort of some something arises experience or good. state. Yes, yeah, exactly. And then you say, well, I'm a better person than you because I've had that. And it's very subtle, you know, it's super subtle. Spiritual I've been ego. totally yeah. caught there. I have yeah. totally been, yeah. I still get caught there. It's so irritating. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, so it, it's just like the, where did this um, capacity and habit for comparing ourselves and, you know, because the Buddha said that, uh, you know, thinking I'm greater than someone is conceit. Well, that's obvious, right? Thinking I'm less than someone, that's conceit too. And this is the people with like the inferior ego. I'm not good enough. I'm not as good as them. But the most subtle is thinking I'm just as good as someone, right? That says, oh, I'm just as good as that person. You would think, well, maybe there's some equality there. Well, I, uh, it, it's subtle, but I can, I, I can say this time and time again. I can never match Wendy's unique brilliance, nor she could she match mine. And that is, we're all the greater for that because if we were all on the same level, it would just be like this gray blob hive mind of how boring and homogenized that would be as well, right? So it was very interesting, as you said, you know, Wendy's amazing uniqueness. And I was going, well, I'm not really amazing, but I'm definitely more amazing than you, Josh. It was just like quick as a flash. It just so you had both. Like... You had inferior ego and superior ego, right? <laughs> and, and equal. <laughs> so, right. So, know, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But See. wow, it was quick as a flash. It just arose. And I'm only saying this because, you know, it's just like this is just the nature of we are kind of, yeah. you know, I'm deeply flawed. I'm I'm not there. I guess the only thing I would say is, you know, I call it out and I'm like, yeah, I'm a doofus. You know, I'm my my favorite my favorite line is, you know, about the great master. It's his birthday today. And he said, last year, old fool. This year, no change. <laughs> and I definitely feel that that's. 
I, I, it's more that I become more aware of how foolish I am. I suppose that's what I would say. Well, and then I would say that, well, I also, I obviously did the same thing. It's like when I look at Wendy, oh, I've, you know, I'm, I'm here and she's there, or she's here and I'm there. And they say, oh, but we're here, you know, so, but the, the foolish thing is, it, it, I, I love the way they put it. I mean, it brings it right down to earth. And at the same time, just seeing that you're no, just because you can see that you're no fool, right? Well, I'm still, full, you know, like, you know, it, 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 but, but it's, it's just, it's like the ego. And, and why do we have this thing? You know, I, I, everybody has an ego. Everybody has it. So there has to be a developmental component to it. So that I really was like, wow, everyone's there. And I've been really thinking a lot about this and going, actually, what, what I was on retreat one time, and I know we've only got one minute and 56 seconds left. <laughs> yes. Um, but I was on retreat one time, and what I realized is that uh, it's the ego is a response to seek social connection in order to remain part of the group, to have that sense of belonging. And when we have the emotional mirroring to support our sense of failure of not working out, you know, we sort of feel ashamed or guilty or, or just shame, humiliated, whatever it is, disappointed then the ego comes in and says no you still belong anyway but you need to if you have somebody to unpack the emotional part of it going it's very hard actually when we care about something and it doesn't quite come together so but if but you can get it later um so just because i used to have quite a strong narcissistic um experience where i and i would say my my thing is um my reference points were external to me and that to me is a marker of where the ego is at now i'm conscious we are less than one minute so what do you want to do josh oh How yeah and another thing that came to mind with that as well is that it could be also trying to control things in order to belong right trying to uh yeah to have control over things or that illusion. So yeah, I guess we'll wrap it up here. Um, we still haven't set a, a, a date, but it'll either be towards the end of this month again or the beginning of next month, but we're trying to get on um, last Thursday of the month, whenever that might work out. But thank you all for joining and thank you, Wendy. And uh, see you again next time, guys. And thank you to all our 16 meditators who came. So thank yes. you very much for all being part of this. It's And 35 on Wisdom app. <laughs> Bye now.